Born in London in 86, Sash showed gent named Richard Parliament. He loves to wrestle, but he loves one more thing, and goes round the world. He fights in his comments and he argues with fans. It's a problem no one understands. If there's two things he loves, it's getting an and helps round the world. Drinking fine wine, fighting fanboys, handhelds round the world. Top Hat Gaming Man. Hello, gentlemen and ladies. Top Gaming Hat Man here, and it is time for another exciting episode of Handhelds Around the World. Today I am in the coastal town of Agios Nikolaios, on the Greek island of Crete. The town sits partially upon the ruins of the ancient city of Latopros Kamara. People settled in the area 5,000 years ago, during the late Bronze Age, back in the year 3000 BC. However, sadly, we are not going to explore that far back in time today, ladies and gentlemen. Instead, we are going to look at more recent history. 28 years ago, to be precise. 1990, the year that featured the birth of the Turbo Express. Yeah! Over the last two years, I have travelled across five different continents, reviewing a number of different handheld consoles and games along the way. Whilst all this has been going on, the Turbo Express has been one of the most requested systems for me to take an in-depth look at on this channel. So now that I finally have one of these little bugs in my possession, let's take a deep look at this system, its history, the games, and why people care so much about this platform. Also, most importantly, whether or not the platform is still worth playing today. It's about time I shifted up into Turbo and made an attempt to um, express myself. Anyway, let's jump straight in. The Turbo Express slash PC Engine GT, depending which region you live in, is NEC's answer to the Game Boy. Released in 1990, one year after the Game Boy in fact, this large and heavy handheld is essentially a portable version of the Turbo Graphics 16, very much like the Nomad is a portable version of the Genesis. The major difference between the Express and the Nomad though is that the Express came out five years earlier. This means it was for a long time the most powerful handheld available on the market. The power in this thing for the time frame it was released was insane when you think about it. It was much more powerful than the majority of people's home consoles and home computers of the day. I, for example, was still only gaming on an Amstrad CPC 464 at the time of the system's release, and I would gather most Americans probably only had an NES. Some lucky buggers around the world, though, had access to this powerhouse on the go. Absolutely mental. The launch price in Japan was 44,800 yen and $250 in the USA. Its primary competition ended up being not only the Game Boy, but the Game Gear and the Atari Lynx. The Turbo Express on a technological level swept all of its competition under the carpet though. Despite the system's insane power level, the Express slash GT only sold 1.5 million units. All its bells and whistles were clearly not enough for NEC against the dominant global marketing of the likes of Nintendo, Sega and Atari at the time. It simply could not gain a meaningful share of the handheld market. The price probably didn't help this little beauty either. As I said, the American launch price was $250. But that then raised to $300 one year later, allegedly due to an increase in production costs for the display. A few months later, it would revert back to $250. But the damage was done. In 1992, they had to drop the price to $199. Even so, they would still never manage to get a proper foothold in any market. So, as I just mentioned, this was the most technically advanced handheld gaming console of its day and was able to play all the Hue cards for the PC Engine or Turbo Graphics home console. The system had other features too, including a TV tuner and an LCD screen which was backlit and had an active matrix. This screen was the same size as the screen on the Game Boy, however unlike the Game Boy, this could display 64 sprites at a time with no lag and was powerful enough to display 481 colours at the same time out of a possible 512. There was 8 kilobytes of RAM and it ran the same CPU as the main console did. It truly was like carrying around a powerful home console with you. 
The system's amazing graphics were complemented with the system's backlight too, which, as we all know, the Game Boy didn't bother the feature until the Game Boy Advance SP, which wasn't bloody released until 2003. The gamepad itself wasn't too dissimilar to the Game Boy either, though it did feature two additional buttons called turbo switches. The point of these was they were meant to be two levels of high speed controller buttons re-triggering which apparently would help the player. Apart from the money you would need to pay out for the unit itself, this state of the art technology would come at another price too, in the form of six AA batteries to power this handheld monster. This thing, as expected, drank power. The six AA batteries only powered the thing for a maximum of three hours, which makes the system's battery life nearly as embarrassing as the Nintendo Switch today. I wonder why people are more tolerant of poor battery life on systems today. It still grinds my gears, to be honest. Despite the poor battery life of the Express, any smart and wealthy child would have procured an AC adapter to use this system in their swanky hotel rooms. But then, what was the point in having a handheld, really, if you cannot get enjoyment out of it on long-haul flights, etc? The Nintendo Switch has been useless to me in that capacity. Do not ever try bringing it to Australia. In regards to the Express, there was one big problem with the device, and that was there was a recurring problem with the sound. This was due to the rubbish capacitors, which were available in the early 90s. In addition to this, Though at the time the screen was state of the art, there was issues with pixels which would foul fairly often. This meant you were paying through the nose for the most expensive device available, and more likely than not you were going to end up by having big technical issues down the line. Another game breaking problem was that due to the games being designed to be played on a telly, writing would often be far too small to read on the tiny screen. A direct result of this was that RPGs and some text-laden adventure games were virtually unplayable. Furthermore, the internal saves which occurred on the consoles were not available on the Express. Instead, you had to be lucky enough to be playing a game with password saves, which wasn't available on every title. Moving from the negatives, and back to the positives on this generally good device, it did have two-player capabilities via the Turbo Link. Only downside is there was hardly any two-player games, so basically, if you were going to pay the big bucks for this peripheral, you needed to really, really love the two-player games you had jointly as much as your wealthy friend who was going to play with or against you. Games which you could have played included Falcon, which was a flight simulator where you could play two-player via a dogfight, or there was Bomberman 93. Not that much else, really. Another weird peripheral was the Turbo Vision, which was basically an adapter which meant you could watch TV on the Express and with a flick of a switch go back to playing games. Come to think of it, the Turbo looks extremely similar to those handheld televisions you could buy back in the day. Those little buggers were horrible on the go, so I would guess that the Turbo Express probably did not fare much better in that regard. As mentioned earlier in the video, the Turbo Express, aka the PC Engine GT, is an extremely sought after console today. The system's power, combined with the lack of units sold to begin with, and the amount of these things which have died, has overall led to a huge demand for these platforms in 2018. The Express has a cult following, and in turn has bred a fascination with the system amongst retro enthusiasts and collectors. In terms of the games for the platform, as mentioned earlier, this system features the same library of Hue cards as the PC Engine, a system I covered in extreme depth in another video on this channel. Amongst this video, I looked at many of the system's great games, all of which can be experienced on the Express. If you are yet to watch that video, then I advise you view it after finishing this one. You will be able to learn about even more of the games from this system's fantastic library. For now though, I am going to cover further fun games I failed to spotlight in this previous video, all of which can be played on this amazing handheld. So let's look at some more gems, yeah. Remember Bonk from my last video? Well now he's back and in punk form. Air Zonk, like many games on the PC Engine, is a side-scrolling shooter which was released in 1992. Air Zonk was an attempt to update the company's image via a modern punkish character called Zonk, who bears a purposeful resemblance to the caveman mascot Bonk. From an artistic standpoint, the game is fun, light-hearted and features many humorous bosses, such as a sentient garbage heap and a bloody anthropomorphic boat. 
The game, as expected, centres around the effective use of shooting and bombing to complete a stage. Air Zonk, and its very distinct visual style, falls into the genre bracket, which is often called a cute em up. Also, the game features three different levels that even Ainsley Harriet would approve of. Sweet, spicy, and bitter. Yeah, boy. The game also received the accolade of Turbo Graphics Game of the Year in 1992, which it was awarded by Electronic Gaming Monthly. Chu Man Fu, released in 1990, is a unique action puzzle game consisting of single screen levels. I have had great fun playing this game, and I cannot really recall playing anything quite like it before. The single screen levels are inhabited by enemies, who can be killed by the firing of one of the balls. When a ball hits an enemy, it will continue moving in the same direction, intervening walls and pushing the player backwards slightly. The ball can also be pushed forward or pulled backwards, including the round corners. The goal is to place balls on the pads of the corresponding colours. Once all the balls are in place, the level is cleared. However, once a ball is placed onto its pad, it can still be moved. In some ways, the game, I suppose, reminds me of Bomberman. However, this game really is its own beast. Crater Maze is a fun game, and in many ways reminds me of Chip Challenge, available on the Atari Lynx. Possibly my favourite game for that platform. Crater Maze is apparently a variation of the Japanese game known as Booby Kids, released for the Famicom in 1987. The game has also been compared to the Bomberman series, although as I stated, it feels a lot more like Chip Challenge to me. In the game, the hero Oppy travels through various eras in time, collecting treasures to open doors to the next era, and killing enemies by digging holes and burying them. A fun, quirky game and a welcome addition to the PC Engine's library. Jackie Chan's Action Kung Fu is an action platform video game developed by Now Productions and published by Hudson Soft. It was first released for the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1990 and for the Turbo Graphics 16 in 1991. In this game, you get to play as everyone's favourite collector and hoarder, Jackie Chan, who has a mental collection of crap by the way, if you would like to look into it. The game is a cartoony, solid, side-scrolling platforming affair, with lots of fun power-ups to use at your disposal. This game is pleasantly surprising when you consider how bad most movie and celebrity licensed games usually are. But Jackie Chan, on the other hand, is a decent one. The game Bloody Wolf received a quality port to the PC Engine. In this run and gun game, you play this game from a side on perspective and can attack in multiple directions. You automatically start out in this hectic game with a machine gun consisting of unlimited ammo and a knife which you can use exclusively for close quarter combat. The missions levels are separated into scenes and usually consist of one or more players running through various terrains, attacking hordes of enemy soldiers and reaching the end of the stage to battle the boss. Players have the option to rescue various hostages scattered throughout the level to obtain new weapons or items. This game is great fun and certainly one I would recommend everyone to try out. Dragon Curse is Wonder Boy 3, but for the Turbo slash PC Engine, as opposed to the Sega Master System. Wonder Boy 3 The Dragon's Trap is a platforming and action adventure video game developed by Weststone, which plays in many ways similar to Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link. I absolutely adore this game, and the recent enhanced HD port of the Nintendo Switch is probably my favourite game on the platform so far. So, for my taste personally, the Turbo version of this game may be my favourite of all. The music and graphics are a lot smarter than the Master System version, and the suit the gameplay style a lot better than the crispy Switch version. So, Dragon's Curse gets a massive thumbs up from me. Any list of great Turbo games would not be complete without at least one space shooter. The system has great games of this genre in absolute huge abundance, and Soldier Blade is one of the many games of this type worth playing. The game plays similarly to many Hudson Soft vertical scrolling shooters. Players control a ship through seven stages. Each one has a mid and end level boss and collect power ups as they progress. Like Superstar Soldier and Blazing Lasers, which we have covered in a previous video, the ship can take multiple enemy hits depending on how many power-ups the player has collected. There are so many great space shooters everyone needs to check out on this platform. JJ and Jeff is worth talking about simply for how bloody weird this game is. The game is known in Japan as Kato-chan and Ken-chan and is a side-scrolling platform game. 
The Japanese version is loosely based on the then popular comedy television show Fun TV with Kato chan and Ken chan, which I have to say I have never bloody seen. The game features offbeat characters, enemies, and toilet humour, including flatulence, urination, and defecation in the Japanese release of this game anyway. In terms of the playstyle, the game plays just like a Tesco value version of Adventure Island, from the controls to the life bar. Adventure Island is obviously a better game, however this game is worth a look at simply for its weirdness. Magical Chase is a scrolling shooter video game developed by Quest and released by Palsoft in 1991. The game was graphically altered for its North American release in 1993 on the TurboGrafx-16 and remains one of the rarest games for the platform in that region. In this game you play as a witch named Ripple as you fly through each level on your broomstick. You also fly along with two anthropomorphic stars which serve as gradius style options. The game has many notable similarities to Cotton as well. The game is a great side scrolling shooter within the cute em up subgenre. Give it a go! Legend of Hero Tonma is yet another arcade game that got ported over to the Turbo. In this side scrolling platformer, the player controls a caped hero named Tommy in his quest to rescue a princess. Tommy can cast fireballs, which can be upgraded in power to dispatch enemies and jump on their head to temporarily stun them. The game includes collecting treasure and keys to proceed through doors, and is a decent fun escapade. The arcade game Ninja Spirit was successfully ported onto multiple platforms. The most popular port is the TurboGrafx-16 format. In this game you play as a ninja and you journey and take your character through seven stages varying from woodlands, wastelands, swamps, temples and cliffs. Each stage begins with the player slashing his way to the end, until he confronts a level boss. This is a fun game which held my attention for a good while. So ladies and gentlemen, that was some more of the games that can be experienced on the Turbo slash PC Engine platforms. All of these games across both this video and the earlier one could miraculously be played on the go using the Turbo Express platform in the early 90s. So is the Turbo Express worth playing today? In some ways I'm going to say yes. The library of games is absolutely amazing and even the system screen and picture quality isn't bad at all for a handheld from 28 years ago. What I will say though is that despite all of this, the system still has its fair share of flaws. These vary from the system's poor battery life to its bulky heavy form factor right up to the system's outrageously expensive costs. If you want to play the system's live on the go today, there are a number of Android gaming tablets available which would offer you both a cheaper and superior experience. Despite all of this though, people are willing to pay even more for this system today than they even did on release, meaning that the system's status is probably on a higher pedestal than ever before. I have to say, for a 1990 handheld, I have never seen a Marvel quite like the Turbo Express. The system truly was the Rolls Royce of handheld gaming platforms, which trumped even most people's home platforms at the time. So my advice would be only procure a Turbo Express if you have a little too much disposable income and, like myself, you are massively into your retro curiosities. So there you have it ladies and gentlemen, that was the history of the Turbo Express, some of the games and whether or not the handheld is worth playing today. On this channel I shall continue to play and review a number of different handhelds from around the world. So after watching this video, has this changed your perception on the platform at all? What do you think of the Turbo Express and is it a system you would be interested in owning yourself? Maybe you already own one. Also which other handhelds would you like to see me cover in the future? Let me know in the comment section. Thank you for watching today's video, do not forget to like comment and subscribe for in-depth gaming videos on this channel every single week. Also if you never want to miss a video please make sure you hit the notification bell to stay notified. It is so important for me to get these videos out that way. My channel Top Hat Gaming Man is partly funded from the fantastic support and donations I receive from my lovely Patreon benefactors who support the Top Hat Trust. So shout outs to Carl Johnson, Shizuka Kobayashi 
Andy Aldridge, Richard Clark, Michael Keneally, Greg Hooper, Harold Webb, Since Spaces, Kevin Fahaley, David Mountford, Andrew Bazanski, Edward O'Reilly, Peter Dawn, Retail Archaeology, Tom Elliott, Mark S. Hines, Gary Pinkett, and all of my other beautiful patrons. You people motivate me every single day to continue to churn out hundreds of hours of ridiculous content. So as always, from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. Cheerio.